Welcome to the Mighty Oak Show. I'm Jeremy Stalnicker, and I'm here with Chad Robichaux, introducing this very first show. And Chad is uh, coming to us remotely from Arizona to the Mighty Oak Studios in Southern California. And we're excited to get this show started. Uh, this really is our opportunity to provide some context around a culture that seems out of control. And we have the opportunity to hopefully provide hope and direction in spite of everything that's happening. I'm excited today to introduce you to our very first guest on episode one of the Mighty Oak Show, John Lowry. John Lowry has been a friend of mine for the last uh, several years in the work that we've done here at Mighty Oaks. John is the Director of Transformational Ministries for Serving USA. Serving USA is an organization, uh, probably our strongest supporters historically, has been Serving USA, and they do a number of things. They work with women in distress and uh, women's homes and, and so much of what goes on there, uh, drug and alcohol abuse situations, dealing with so many of those crazy situations, uh, prison and veterans, and we're kind of their veterans ministry, I guess, and uh, you deal with the uh, the prisons primarily. Uh, John, thank you for being with us on this very first show. It's great to be here. This is a beautiful studio, by the way. I absolutely love it's it. It's beautiful. It's not big, but it is beautiful. Oh, it is big. Yeah. Actually, it's, yeah. it's a good size for this. And uh, our new office is, uh, is cool. We call this our uh, training center. There you go. You can say call anything anything you want to, but, <laughs> but it is our headquarters. And well so, done. Yeah, we're excited about it. But uh, came up from San Diego. Thank you for spending time with us. Um, let's start with your story. You have an amazing story, and uh, I love it. Uh, we've actually done some ministry together in the prison. Yes. Uh, Mighty Oaks has taken a team to Sentinel Prison a few times and done three day sessions there. And uh, if you want. An experience, unless you've been in prison, and if any of our viewers have been in prison, this may not mean as much to you, but for the rest of us, uh, going inside of the prison is a whole new experience. But having John uh, made it all okay. Talk about your story, uh, kind of where you started, maybe growing up, how you ended up in prison, what that experience looked like for you, and then how that led to where you are now. Well, growing up, I came from what I call the average broken home. My parents went through a divorce. I ended up living with my mom and a sister, and mom was working two jobs. So that left a lot of free time for us kids, right. and uh, I started getting in trouble real it's early. It's hard for me to believe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is hard to believe. Yeah. But getting in trouble it just seemed to be a natural thing. Uh, we understand we all have a sin nature, so it's natural for me to <laughs> right. do this. Right. Um, but my trouble soon escalated. I started uh, robbing drug houses, and I did that for several years, and I ended up with a 30-year prison sentence here in California. Yeah, wow. And um, I went to prison, uh, 23 years old, a young kid thought everything was kind of fun and games. I didn't yeah. care about much of anything. And with 30 years, I wasn't really looking at going home. It was so sure. far away, it was a fantasy land. So I got in trouble. I started running with the gangs and all that. Um, eventually, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitations determined that uh, prison gangs were gonna be tagged as state threat groups. And they took the leaders and the members off the prison general population lines. <clears throat> and they segregated us. So I spent uh, four years in segregation for not for a rule violation, but for being yeah. a gang member. And what's uh, segregation look like? Um, segregation is a minimum of twenty three hours a day in your cell. Usually, you're going to do four four days out of a week, never coming out of your cell. You'll be able to come out once a week for an hour of yard time, exercise time, and um, if if you're lucky, you get a shower uh, every other day yeah. as a regular deal. Uh, we were so violent in causing so much trouble that they stripped property away from us. So we had uh, flip-flops, plastic yeah. flip-flop right, flip right. shoes, boxers and t-shirts, and we had paper to write and envelopes to have, but they would only give us pen fillers. So we had to roll <laughs> them up in paper to wow. have a pen to write wow. with. Segregation is pretty brutal. Yeah. But I spent four years there. Uh, during that time period, I had a transformation from someone that didn't care about the world to becoming a Christian. And it wasn't segregation that did it to me. Uh, I had somebody started writing to me out of nowhere from okay. back east. This lady started writing to me and said, I'm a Christian and I'm going to you know, witness to you. And right, I never right. wrote to anybody in prison right. before. And I'm thinking she's a crazy lady. Yeah. So she started sending me all this. These envelopes would be like that thick, an inch thick with all this Christian stuff in it. And I'd throw it away, literally. I'd right. take that Christian stuff out and throw it away. And I'd write a letter back, answer her letter. 
And uh, one day I just was frustrated and got tired of it. And I wrote back to her and I said, look, you know, I don't like people. I especially don't <laughs> like Christians. Um, and you're because, both. you know, well, you know, yeah, sure. I, I didn't, I wasn't using her for money or anything. Right, I'm just right, writing right. to her, which right. was strange in that world anyway, because yeah. in the prisons, there's a lot of using that goes on. They use people for money and for canteen <clears throat> and for um, packages and stuff that you can get. Right. But uh, I wrote to her and I told her, I don't like people. I especially don't like Christians because, you know, they talk about each other behind their back. They they lie. They do things just like regular people. Well, was that your experience growing and, up? And that How was, did you believe that? That was my experience in prison. In prison. Because I was watching people, in my opinion, that would run to church to become a Christian right. for protection. Right. And they were still drinking the alcohol sure, and doing sure. the drugs and stuff. So I didn't want anything to do with them. Right. And um, as I'm writing to her, I told her, I said, I don't like people, but I like dogs. And I said, the reason I like a dog is a dog is always happy to see you. It'll always listen to you. It'll never tell on you. Right. <laughs> and so I sent this letter out thinking, okay, this lady's gone. She's right. done. Right. A week later, I got a regular size envelope, and it was real thin. <laughs> it wasn't big. It wasn't right. full of Christian right. stuff. But I opened it up, and it had a single-page letter in it, and there was a tract. You know those little uh, storybooks yeah. you hand out as Christians? Yeah. And it was called Barry the Heroic Dog. And I threw that tract in the trash, and I opened the letter up, and the first sentence said, Don't throw this away. Read it. I know, it's, I know you threw it away. <laughs> Read it. It's important. Yeah. And I literally put my hands on my hips. And thought, wow, who's this lady? So I got this the tract out of the trash. And there's a story from 1957 National Geographic. You can look it up online. It's called Barry the Heroic Dog. Huh. And Barry had 47 rescues, I think was the number. And uh, this was a story of Barry's 42nd res 47th rescue. Yeah. And this is what made him famous. Well, he's a dog that looks for people in the snow. Not necessarily avalanches and stuff, but just lost in the snow yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And the process is they let the dog go and they track the dog and the dog runs around and finds the person. If you're down, it's trained to lay on you because of hyperthermia. And the owner would just track the dog, find him and rescue yeah. you. Well, Barry on his 47th rescue went out and he was looking for this person lost in the snow and he found him. He was down in the snow and he tried to lay on him and the man was hyperthermic and he thought it was a wolf. So he took his knife and he stabbed the dog in right, the side. Right. Now all that did was make me mad. I threw that <laughs> track in the trash. What's this woman sending yeah. me stuff about this dog right. killer, you know? Right. And, uh, but I picked it back up to finish reading. And it says the dog did what a dog would do. It turned around. It ran back towards the owner because it's hurt. And it's, yeah. no, there is safety and there's food and there's help. Well, the dog died. That made me madder. I got even madder. I was so mad at this lady. You wanted to find that guy. Oh, I'll find that lady and just tell her exactly what I thought. But uh, so um, the man was tracking the dog and he found the dead dog. Mm -hmm. And this is the story. You can, like I said, you can read yeah. it in National Geographic. Yeah. And he followed the blood and found the man wow. that was dead, or wow. that was down in the yeah. snow. And that was Barry's 47th rescue. Wow. Okay. Then it said there's a trail of blood that leads to cavalry. Mm -hmm. And I could relate to that because the dog did nothing, just like Jesus did nothing. Yeah. And the people abused him and, and they didn't kill him. He laid his life down, sure. but they sure. stabbed sure. him and everything. Sure. And it's the trail of blood to Calvary that led me to the Lord. So immediately, uh, just absolutely different than anything I've ever done in my whole life. I just stopped everything and just became a Christian. Bam, magic like that. Wow, I'm a Christian. And I'm... I'm running with the gangs. I'm in segregation. So now this is a threat to my life to become a Christian. Mm. Because if you become a Christian and you're especially a gang member, yeah. the assumption is you're going to tell. You're going to be, you're going to do something to get out of the hole, yeah. get out of segregation. Right. You're going right. to tell. Um, but I don't see anywhere in the Bible where God said, become a Christian and become an informant. Right. <laughs> so I never did right. that. I, I wrote it out. Um, I went out to several, what you call council meetings out on the yard with the gangs to determine whether or not they should stab me or not. And I never went anywhere. I just stayed there. Um, eventually, I was released from segregation, and I was put in a mainline population down at Calipatria Prison down in the desert. And at Calipatria Prison, I did my last four years of my prison sentence there on B Yard, Bravo Yard. Right. And um, as a Christian uh, who came to a prison with a 
history of being a gang member, of running uh, drugs and running weapons and being involved in violence, I came to the prison and the Christians did not trust me. The gangs did not trust me. The guards did not trust me. And I did not know where I stood. But I know one thing is that as a Christian, I'm always going to be brutally honest. Right. And I'm going to stand my ground. Right. And so that paid off. I stayed the four years on the main line. Oh, wow. And on February 24th, 1998, almost 21 years ago today, um, I paroled wow. from Calipedra Prison. And um, <laughs> wow. I, I paroled to a city, like two cities over from where the prison was. And so that's a drama in itself, yeah, sure. too, because sure. there's nothing in the city of Raleigh except for farmers, police of some one right. kind or another. Sure, They're sure. prison guards, border patrol, right. ICE agents, sheriffs or city police, right. <laughs> and dope fiends. That's all that's there yeah. because it's a it's one of the poorest counties in the country. Mm. And that's where I paroled to was yep. the city of Raleigh. And um, immediately I attached myself to a church there yeah. and uh, started uh, being ministered to in that church and wanting to give back. Yeah. And I was amazed because uh, prison guard families that knew me, the prison guards who knew me inside, um, enveloped me with love, just as Christians should do, sure. but they did it carefully also. Yeah, sure. They weren't stupid. Sure. And uh, so these relationships began to build, and uh, that has evolved into uh, quite a ministry yeah. that I've done over the last 20, almost 21 years, just a few right. days short of 21 years. How, uh, how important has it been to you? This is something we talk about in our program all the time. The idea of, we use the phrase, paying it forward, really giving back, and, and how that is so essential to someone's healing after trauma. I mean, really, yours was a life of trauma up to that point. Uh, how, how important was that where you were giving back, or how different would it be if you hadn't done that? A person who does not give back loses purpose. Yeah. Um, God created us with a purpose, and that purpose is to give. Our purpose is to serve. And if you close that down, then you're just going to envelop yourself with the same sins that you had before. And I'm not a, you know me, I'm not a Bible thumper. I just try and live what it is. You're trying to be a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Right. Yeah. I'm a a rough Christian. (laughs) But um, in giving back, if I don't give back, then I'm idle. Yeah. And if I'm idle, I'm going to get in trouble because I have that personality. I have an addictive personality. I have an, a, um, a, an outgoing personality. Yeah. And I need to be able to express that with a positive tone instead of a negative because tone. Because you are going to express it somehow. Oh, yes. I'm yeah. going to, we right. all will. We'll express right. it somehow. I mean, people ask me about my father. Uh, my father taught me how not to be a father. Mm-hmm. My dad beat us. My dad didn't sure. listen to us. He sure. was he was rough. Yep. And uh, I learned how not to be a father. Yep. So now as a stepfather, I apply the good things yep. that I have learned about how to be a father. And I, I know that in everyday life, I need to do that. In the prison ministries, as well as uh, working with women in domestic, vi- coming out of domestic violence or coming out of human trafficking, yep. it's the same. Yep. Same with working with veterans with PTSD or veterans who are just transitioning. They don't okay. have to right, have PTSD. Right. Right. We need to have that positive channel for them yep. because you can so quickly envelop yourself with negativity gotcha. that you're going to stop. And once you stop, you're stagnant. Right. And that's what we call pond scum. <laughs> you just, just you know, stagnant. you just get covered, and it scum. sucks the oxygen out of the water, right. and it takes the life out of it. It's crazy because we talk about purpose all the time, and you use that word purpose. Um, it's hard for people to understand purpose who don't believe in God mm-hmm. and don't believe in creation, because we were created with purpose, and the purpose as created in the image of God was to invest in others, was to be fruitful and multiply, and that doesn't just mean in having children. It means to to invest in something that's going to produce fruit. And so once we stop doing that, we lose our purpose. That's right. Which was to benefit others. So along with that, you and I were talking about this briefly when we started, is is the idea of, I'll use the words, kind of a church word, redeeming mm-hmm. a trial or redeeming a trauma. And, and this is something that needs to be said. And, and for those who are watching our show, trauma is not reserved for those who have been in prison or in a gang or veterans who have been in combat, trauma is something that's, it's a life ailment because of sin and brokenness. We all have experienced trauma, but the way to redeem that trauma to make it more than just something bad that happened in your past 
is to use it while ministering to others. And you talked about that. Um, talk about that a little bit more. Uh, you know, use the phrase, I'd never change or I wouldn't change my past. Oh, yes. I had a friend that was giving a testimony, and he's a world champion skateboarder, yep. uh, well-known from the old school yep. and everything. And he lost everything. He was he was 16 years old making $40,000 a month in the right. late 70s. Right. And obviously that led to drug use and everything else. He lost his world championship to it. Yeah. He sold his world championship trophy, mm. this big, huge stainless steel thing. Or, you know, it looks stainless yeah. steel. Yeah, it's yeah, probably yeah. silver, sure. but I tease him about <laughs> it. But he, he sold it for 500 bucks a dope. He held a girlfriend in his arms who died, who mm. was uh, shot through the throat, I believe is the story, held her in his arms yeah. while she died because he was in that drug world. Every lost everything, uh, relationships with family and yeah. everything. Yeah. But he now is a person that gives back. So when he's giving his testimony, he's talking about all this stuff he's been through in his life. Yeah. And he said, I wouldn't change any of it at all. And it froze me. Yeah. Because he stopped, and I'm like, are you dumb? Yeah. Wouldn't you Yeah, change? why wouldn't you change that? Yeah, why yeah. would you not change yeah. that? And these words came out of his mouth. He said, because that put me in a position to do what I do today. Yeah. And what's he do today? He runs Training Center. He's a founder of Training Center, which is a drug and alcohol rehabilitation yeah. center down in San, Southeast San Diego, yeah. right in the hood. He does... Uh, prison ministries up and down the state. He does uh, anti-bullying, anti-gang, anti-drug programs right. in San Diego Unified and Los Angeles school districts. He does what are called X-Fest events where he brings uh, sports people from around the country to come and they bring all the drama, whether it's arm wrestling or, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, you know, yeah. X-Game yeah, guys right, doing right. flips and all that, to draw <clears throat> people to him, to tell them about Jesus. And this is what he does. It gave yeah. him purpose. And he could not do that had he not experienced right the loss and the drama that he that he had before. Now, you said something about like uh, what uh, trauma is in a life. Yeah. I'm a pastor, yep. and I do weddings. Yep. And I tell the couple, I say, you know, the, there's a love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. It starts off with love is patient, love yep. is kind. And that's the foundation to everything, right. and I can prove it to you. Because the I don't care how badly you've been beaten or how much somebody has hurt you physically. The thing that has hurt you the most in your life has been words someone has said to you because words never go away and they build huge scars in our hearts. Yeah. And I said, you can listen to a song and cry because you remember a moment right. when that song was playing because right. those words are powerful. Yeah. So I, I, I counsel these couples getting married that no matter what, always be patient and be kind with each other because when you're not feeling too patient, remind yourself, I need to be kind. I'm dealing with an idiot. You know, he or she's arguing with <laughs> right. me. And when you don't feel so patient, you need to be kind right. because a kind word turns away wrath. Right. And applying that in our lives is very important to me. But dealing with trauma yeah. in our lives is all of us have trauma. All of oh, us do. That's right. That's right. And, and that's why I love the Mighty Oak so much is just because of what you do is actually like a CrossFit hmm. for anyone out there. It, yep. it isn't just yep. for veterans right, right, at right. all. We happen to have a veteran audience, but, yes. but trauma is not reserved for veterans. No, it's not. And, and using, using our past, using our history, I think is what has made us effective with veterans. I think it's what makes you effective in the prison. Mm -hmm. uh, so for veterans, veterans are really fond of putting up a wall and on that wall, there's a sign that says, no one knows what it's like to be me, you know, or you don't, you don't understand, or you haven't been there. And so the difference between us and others is that when you come to one of our programs and you've, you've come and, and yeah. been a part of one of our programs, when you come to one of our programs, you're sitting in a room full of people just like you, yes, who have a story just like yours. The difference is they don't allow their trauma to define them or identify them, mm -hmm. but they use that story and they tell those, those testimonies, they use that story in a redemptive sense to say, I know where you've been. I know what you've done. I know what you've experienced. And the reason I know it is because I've, I've been there. Mm -hmm. I've done that. I've experienced that. But it no longer has a hold on me because I've now aligned my life to the life that God created me to live. You do the same thing in prison. And, and I've seen you do it. We, we went to that first, uh, first program that we did at Fight Club. Fight Club. Um, at Sentinel Prison. And that was a crazy situation, right? We, we went there to, to, to do a program for veterans and the warden, who uh, is tremendous, um, ex marine, and, and former yeah, retired marine, former marine, marine. yeah, Hoorah. yeah, <laughs> and uh, he's awesome. He said, "I'll let you come and I'll let you have a program for veterans, but first, 
You have to go to the yard where the life without the opportunity parole guys are and take a he wanted them. He specifically wanted us to pull the guys that came out of Pelican Bay. Yep. Every one. We had 32 people, yes. I believe, in the yeah. in the first program. Yeah. And every one of them had done more than 20 years in segregation at Pelican Bay. It's crazy. More than 20, 20 years. years. Yeah. Yes. And I'll know that forget. situation you described, 23 hours in your cell, yes. maybe an hour out, very small cell sizes, 23 yes. years of that. Yes. Yeah. Single celled. Yeah. No, no celly, nothing. Crazy. And uh, cell extractions, yeah. tear gas, pepper spray was normal, right. you know, stabbings, <laughs> right. everything going on, right. all the crazy stuff. And he wanted, the warden wanted those yeah. guys to go there because... As a warden, he wants them to succeed. Absolutely. It's it's not as confrontational of a relationship as you think. Yeah. Everyone's trying to have a community that operates, lives yeah. peacefully. Right. And you have to right. do it. But you laughed, kind of chuckled about going there. I was amazed because all of you veterans that came with me, even Big Chris, yeah. who's, who's passed away now, right. um, you guys were like, what do we have in common with yeah. those guys? Right. With, and you use that word with those guys. Yeah. <laughs> and I was chuckling going, yeah. wait till you get in there. Yeah. Because there's no difference. There's no difference. They're just in a different uniform <clears throat> and they've made worse choices and that, possibly. And that was the power of the testimony, yes. right? So what do we have in common? You told us this when we went in. You said, here's what you have in common. They consider themselves warriors, soldiers. Mm -hmm. They're in a battle. They're in a war. And so if you'll tell those stories, you'll have a connection. And that's exactly what happened. Immediately. It, it immediately happened. Not because we were guys that went in and took a Bible and a bunch of stuff. We had us and stories of combat, stories of brokenness, stories of hurt, and and talked about how we were able to move past some of that. And there was a connection with people I never thought I would even have a conversation with, let alone no. connect with. No. And I saw you do that. I mean, I, I remember one instance where we were talking about something. I don't know what we were talking about. And one of the guys looked at you and said, well... You're on the other side of this. You don't understand. And you immediately shut that down and said, I understand exactly where you're coming yeah, from. Yeah, I'm right, because right there in your I, shoes. I've been right there. That's right. Uh, I'm a little further along than you, but I get it. Mm -hmm. Because that's how you redeem trauma and brokenness. Yeah. And that's how you're used by God. And redemption, it was so beautiful to watch. Um, the men from Mighty Oaks came in there and we did the Fight Club, which was interesting to let the Department of Corrections right. call a program the Fight, <laughs> fight Club. Club right. Like we're all going to go into the gymnasium and fight. <laughs> right. Um, but we went in there. We're fighting for the important things we're in life. That's the, the name, right? Right. But we went in there and there was this one guy. Uh, his name was Michael. And yeah. he sat like this with yeah. his arms like this. And he was he's a relatively famous person. He'd been in the papers and everything. But he was also... Uh, three quarters of the way up on the gang, you know, gang ladder. Yep. Um, and he'd done his segregation. People on the yard looked up to him and everything. And uh, his life had fallen apart. He'd been convicted of two uh, homicides, two murders that uh, he, he states he did not do. Right. And, uh, you know, he, he felt wrongly convicted. He was angry. And uh, he's an African-American, so he feels even that pressure sure. inside there. Sure. And like the justice system failed me. Everything. He said, all my friends failed. Right. He was going to college and doing well. He had a scholarship on basketball and was doing great. And he got picked up for these two homicides mm -hmm. and sentenced to double life sentence. And he sat back there with his arms folded. He didn't say much of anything. Right. And a couple times he would peel off and talk to one of the vets or he'd come and talk to me. Yep. And... Uh, I'll never forget the third day when we came back. We came back on a Sunday. Uh, we came back on Sunday, and I had a message to him because I got a phone call from his wife. Yeah. And she wanted to know, what did you do to my husband? <laughs> this guy is right. talking about a fight plan, getting a corner man to help right. him how to fight to keep his marriage and how right. to fight to get out right. of the gangs right. and how to fight to better his life. And here it is a couple of years later. This is absolutely Unbelievable. He is uh, in line for commutation of his sentence by the governor because his life has changed so wow. dramatically. Wow. He has become an influence to peace on that yard between wow. not just his That's own crazy. gang members, but cross gang members. Yeah. His wife has faithfully attended church, given her life back to the Lord. They do Bible studies out in visiting and all. Awesome. And, and for nothing other than some people came and gave a story of how to be redeemed by the love of God. Yep. Our friend Tim Kennedy is with us. And uh, I don't think I need to give you an introduction, Tim, but I'm going to anyway, uh, because hopefully we get you in front of some, some new people that hadn't met you yet. And they can 
uh, learn about the exploits of Tim Kennedy <laughs> and his uh, in his peak straw. So, <laughs> but T- Tim's a uh, was a top five uh, UFC fighter, uh, Ranger, Sniper, Green Beret, uh, just a incredible military history. And then uh, did some more stuff uh, beyond the military, uh, really in the public realm. I was on the History Channel and hunting hunting Hitler two ep- two seasons. Uh, three. Three, three seasons. Seven. They hit on 27. <laughs> <laughs> so lots of seasons on Hunting Hitler. Uh, I don't know if they found him yet. But uh, and then he was on Discovery Channel on a show called Hard to Kill, where actually people tried to murder Tim in each episode. And uh, luckily you're still alive and with us today. And yes. uh, so hey, but when we, when I first met you, it was 2010, and uh, we were both sponsored by Ranger Up, which is a company we've been involved with for a long time. And we were fighting in Strike Force, and then really cool. We had an after fight party together. I remember being so excited because I was already a fan of you before we were friends. And then, I, and then I fought in the same car with you, and had this after fight party. It was supposed to be epic, and then it was kind of bittersweet because I won my fight, and you lost the fight that I thought you won uh, to Jacare. <laughs> and we, so that was when we first we first met. And uh, yeah, that was that was a rough night. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I was trying to be happy and celebrate, but you know, we had uh, Toby Nunn there crying because it was a match. <laughs> Toby's always <laughs> crying, Toby, man. He's I always crying, that guy. Man, I've been on hunt with him, and he starts Canadian crying. I was like, problem. why are you crying? <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. But a lot's changed in your, your life since uh, 2010. You've, uh, you've really amassed uh, a, a lot of uh, popularity and status and you know, people love all the stuff that you do. And, and, uh, but, and I think there's probably a million probably podcast out there that would really talk about like your big fights and, and, uh, a lot of different things in your life, like hunt, hunting, hunting Hitler and, and hard to kill. But I want to go a little bit further back and, and really talk about like how you became, you know, Tim Kennedy, which I, I know your dad, Mike, uh, you come from an amazing family. Your dad's a, a amazing hero to this country. And just really what shaped your life into coming, how you grew up, what brought you to join the military, special forces, and, and really what shaped you as a child. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I find it funny now where like celebrity or I, I was just hanging out with the family. Um, I just got back from a deployment overseas and um, got to spend the weekend with my family for the first time in a minute. And we're going around and, you know, people come up and say, hey, Tim, I can't get and they're like shaking. They want to take photos of me. And, you know, you, you see you've been amassing this popularity of late. I haven't done anything different ever. I'm too old. I'm too hairy. I'm too scarred. I'm too dumb to change. So I just keep doing the same things. And now I just, I, I find it ironic that we are moving circularly back to a beginning where people are appreciating hard work, resilience, a relentless attitude, um, that being damaged and broken doesn't mean that you're a failure. You know, it just means that you've lived a lot of life. Um, and that's, uh, I, I think that's kind of where our origin starts and mine does is, uh, is my home with a bunch of pretty incredible people and role models to look up to. Yeah. What were some of those influences? You come to a place now where, you know, it is about not being a victim, not uh, allowing people to call you a victim, personal responsibility and those things. Uh, what we learn often is that some of the things that damage us happen in youth but also some of the principles that build the character in us that allows us to perform as adults also begins in youth. Uh, what were some of those things in your early years, you know, before the military, before all these things that people know about that helped to shape you along that, that route? Maybe even if it wasn't, you know, perfect, didn't get you there, but it started, started you along that path. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to join your guys' club and be writing a book this year. And um, kind of what we're talking about right now is – you're going to have two different storylines, these two arcs. The first arc is me being an absolute moron time and time again, (laughs) failing, um, getting crushed, losing, getting blown up. Um, like I, I, the, 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 the dumb things that I did throughout my life, a period of time where I thought I had AIDS, I had a couple of women pregnant. Neither of them were the woman that I was living with. Um, and, that is one storyline, one arc of all of these things that ultimately should have broken a normal person, Hmm. but tied to the current timeline of what I am doing now and the things that I did in my military career and the things that I did in my fighting career, fighting for world titles, going overseas multiple times, earning medals medals for valor. Those things are directly tied to the times that I'm, I'm taking off my clothes in Morro Bay, California, and I'm walking 
next to the right side of the rock, just on the north side. And I'm going to swim out to the fog because I don't know what else I'm going to do. Um, cause everything else in my life has gone wrong. Crash my motorcycle. My, one of my heroes, my grandpa just died. Um, I think I have AIDS. Um, I just lost my professional debut. There's two women that are pregnant in my life and they're both telling me I'm the father. Um, you know, like that is, and yeah. I'm going to go for a swim into the fog, mm-hmm. you know, and then, uh, fast forward 10 years and I'm, and I'm, and I'm running into the fog, the brown out of a helicopter, uh, towards the sound of gunfire you know it's um like i can't give you enough examples of the times that i failed as a youth um so we'll we'll talk about my my heroes uh first and foremost is my dad and my brother yeah Yeah. um they're both just amazing i love you guys (laughs) let me drink out my pink straw again (laughs) thank you so proud (sighs) yeah Yeah, mike's incredible he is so I grew up with a dad that was a narcotics officer. He was part of these pretty incredible task forces during the the peak of the war on drugs. Mm-hmm. If you think back to the war on terrorism that you know that that we were part of, um, like those were some pretty good years. You know, where you're in Iraq in 05, 06, Wild Wild West. You know, you're in you're in Afghanistan, 07, 08. Yeah, pretty, pretty good times, you know, like a lot of things you could get away with. Well, that, that was my dad's era of the war on drugs, hmm. where he's flying to these Caribbean places to steal planes of cocaine from Pablo Escobar and fly them to the United States, where he's asking his 10 and 12 year old sons, respectively, my older brother and myself, to sneak into a garage. He's like, hey, there's a yellow Camaro in there. I need the license plate. And if it's unlocked, see if you can get some stuff out of the glove box. You know, like <laughs> that was what he was asking. <laughs> my um, and that was normal in my life where we'd go to the Oregon river and we would just drive from campsite to campsite. My, my mom would drive, but me, my brother, my dad, and my eight year old sister would float down the white water rapids by float. I mean, we didn't have inner tubes. We just swam it. And that was normal because I had a water polo Olympic level athlete of a father and then a freak athlete of an older brother and then an insane little sister. Um, this was just normal, you know, and pushing off the ground and getting like a, a rock shoved halfway through your foot. You get to the next campsite and your dad's like, well, I forgot the tweezers. So we're going to use the pliers, boy. You know, you're like, this is awesome. You know, it made everything in life seem so easy. Yeah. And it is. Life's easy. Yeah. We uh we talk a lot about decision. Um, you know, one of the great in my opinion, one of the great books ever written was Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Uh he was in a concentration camp as a psychiatrist and kind of evaluated what was happening there. And he concluded after watching all of this for a few years that the one thing you can't take away from a person is their ability to decide. They get to decide what they're gonna do with their life. They get to decide if they're gonna move forward or stay where they are. They get to make a decision. And I think the difference often between someone who performs after thinking they have AIDS and getting women pregnant that they're, you know, not in a relationship with and all the other brokenness that we uh, might talk about is a decision. I'm not going to let that define me. I'm going to decide to do something important. What what were those decision points in your life? Maybe some, some times where you said I had to decide that I was going to move forward instead of fall back. Yeah. Um, there's so many like, right right before we, we started filming this um this kid one of my friends puts me on the phone with a kid that just failed buds and you know he's like i don't know what i'm gonna do and i was like what, what do you mean you don't know what you're gonna do you're gonna get up and you're gonna keep going he's like yeah. well I'm, I'm i'm a broken failure i'm like what so <laughs> i told him a story about me on a run this morning and i'm pushing my four-year-old who is about the size of Chad? <laughs> that's not that's not saying a, a lot. A, a <laughs> it's really a four year old. <laughs> and we're in a little bop scroller, and I got my two dogs, and we're going up a hill, and I get like four fists away up this hill, and I'm like, "Ooh, this is a big hill." It feels like I'm doing a sled push with a ninety pound sack of blood <laughs> in the bop scroller, which is my four year old son, and I get and I, and I have to walk the last fifth of the hill. And I tell this kid, I was like, do you want, I just failed a run this morning. Imagine that. I have my son sitting there looking at me and I can't even make it up a hill. So does that mean I'm broken? Does that mean I'm a failure? Does that give me an opportunity to come back tomorrow and do that same hill and be a little bit faster, be a little bit stronger, and a little bit harder to kill? 
And that's what all of those instances of my life have been where when that Coast Guard boat rolled up to me in Morro Bay, California, and that captain looked down at me and he says, hey, boy, that, that water looks pretty cold. I'm like, that's not a nice <laughs> thing to say to a naked dude swimming in cold water. Um, but yeah, man, I'm pretty cold. And I don't know which way, way the shore is because I'd swam so far out of that fog. Um, you know, and he gives me a choice. He gives me an option. He gives me a deciding point of, hey, do you want to come up here? Um, or you want to figure this out? And I was like, if I get up there, can I have a blanket to cover up what's going on right now? And uh, Tony <laughs> gave me a blanket. But whether it's like ranger school where I'm in an ambush line and it's in the middle of winter, it's December. We're about to start an ambush. I'm freezing. I'm shaking. And my, my tiny little frozen peckers is like vibrating off that frozen <laughs> ground. I'm behind a 240 waiting for those two for the humvees to roll by so we can do this ambush and the dude next to me just stands up and he walks down to the road he's like rangers i'm done i quit and they're like well cool head head uh head back up the road a little bit and you got some hot coffee and i was like hot coffee did you just say hot coffee, he said, hot coffee. how do i quit how do i get out of this thing and then the ambush starts you know like it was almost that the decision point was taken from me but i was either a little bit too dumb or a little bit too tough to know how to quit and that, you know, went on to become the honor graduate of Ranger School to um, go back to my special forces unit and go to an even more elite team. Um, and, you know, sometimes you you got to make a bunch of tiny little decisions that put you in a position to not fail, right. where that decision point's almost made for you. And that's what I keep doing is, man, I just keep trying to do the right thing 99% of the time. Sometimes I've made mistakes, clearly, but sometimes I'm just like, I don't have any other option besides to jump out of this aircraft or to pull that trigger because that's the right thing to do because I've done everything right so far. Yeah. You just keep moving forward one step at a time. Today, uh, our guest is Matt Whitman. Matt has uh, a lot of content on YouTube and uh, elsewhere. His uh, moniker is the 10-Minute Bible Hour, which, <laughs> which is a crazy title, the 10-Minute Bible Hour, but uh, it's awesome. And uh, Matt spends a lot of time talking about the Bible, talking about uh, – man, tons of issues. And uh, for me, in the last couple of weeks, it's become kind of a good archive of just great information and uh, videos I can send to folks that are even dealing with things related to Christianity and the Bible. And uh, Matt, appreciate you uh, coming on from uh, South Dakota, which looks like it's cold yeah. in South Dakota. My pleasure. Uh, we got a lot of snow today for an early October day. It's, uh, it's pretty fun. The ski resort will fill up with snow and then we'll fill up with people. Yeah, that sounds horrible. Um, Every part of what you just said sounds, sounds terrible, but that's all right. Uh, I'm sure it's wonderful, and we appreciate uh, all of our South, South Dakota viewers. Oh, man. Matt, tell me uh, in our audience, kind of give us your background, your history. How does a guy get into uh, producing videos about the Bible? You've got a huge following on YouTube, so a lot of people are watching and listening. Um, how did you get there? Uh, yeah, well, I'm a pastor's kid, so I was raised around Bible and church and all of that stuff. Um, I suppose I did it early on because – mom and dad were into it and you want to be, I don't know. I, I picked the, um, the cooperative pastor's kid route. I know yeah. a lot of my pastor's kid friends picked the, um, the difficult pastor's kid yeah, I'm route. A, I'm and a pastor's they, kid and, uh, boy, what a crowd that is to be a part of. Were you the cooperative type or did you have to come around later? I've gone back and forth. I've gone back and okay. forth over time. It took me a while yeah. to get here. Yeah, me too. I, sometimes <laughs> I think I uh, go back and forth, uh, two or three times each year. Um, yeah, stop. But, but that's, no, I, I really mean that. The, um, the early going of faith was just very much, I mean, who wouldn't believe their dad? Like, he knows what he's doing. He went to school for this. He's a good man. He's smart. And so uh, very much my faith was kind of vicarious through him. I uh, went to college, went to Trinity College in Deerfield, Illinois. Um, I was a Christian there, I guess, and learned some new stuff. And you kind of wonder why you think what you think. And then uh, – quickly got into ministry after that just family business I guess I mean you're young but you've seen your dad do it forever so you kind of know what to do people kind of need help and you just gradually find yourself there without ever really trying then you realize you don't know anything about the bible so you got to go and actually learn some stuff about that and pick up some school and so I did a, a minor in biblical studies and I went to seminary um, and then after doing that for about 10 years the whole thing just broke uh, it really questions about the bible caused my my kid faith to fall apart. Um, I, there's the only honest way to say it is I went from uh, pastor and seminary graduate to atheist for a chunk of time, but I, not a mad one, 
yeah. I, I wanted it to work out. I wasn't mad at anybody. I feel like anybody lied to me or cheated me. I just, just very authentically didn't feel like there was a God or the Bible made any sense for a chunk of time. And that's tough to feel like you're letting people down. I mean, you don't want to feel like all these people who you've kind of helped along all of a sudden, you're creating a crisis of faith for them. And so it's a tough time. And decided I'd give the Bible a read through one more time since I put a lot of time into it. Um, before I started kind of letting people know, just not like a proud announcement. I don't like you anymore, but a sad yeah. announcement. Yeah. I, I, I want to be in. I just, I just don't believe it anymore. And so before making such an announcement, I started reading the Bible. And I'm not kidding, man. I got through maybe 20 chapters of just reading it cold without an eye to teach it to somebody else or anything like that. And it's like, oh, this actually makes a ton of sense. Sure. I've, I've been conditioned to read the Bible as a young person the lens is a better behavior and and really everything being about myself whether it's i'm naughty or i'm awesome or i get things me 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 and the document just doesn't hold together with me as the main character but 20 chapters in i was like oh god's the main character that's the continual thread that makes all this narrative hold together and then the thing just clicked on that read through and i think i became a christian when i was a little kid but i think i became an adult christian just on that quiet alone read through of the bible that i did for myself after seminary yeah then i uh i ended up you know back in the church doing the pastor thing and pretty soon i'm putting all this work into writing content that i I hope will be helpful about specific books of the bible and i was vain enough to think i should point a camera at myself and that somebody on the internet might want to hear what i have to say about it and um yeah and i i guess some people wanted to watch and then a lot more people started watching and I hopefully kept getting a little bit better at it. And now, um, I don't know, I make videos on the internet about the Bible. Yeah. I guess that's how you get there. That's Faith how you crisis, get learn some stuff, fail a lot. Right. And, uh, really, and really short real quick. Just something in yeah, your spare time kind of, kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> and be an arrogant enough cuss to think that you got something that's worth saying on the internet. So I, I think people, re- people really do want to know, uh, why we believe the Bible and what the Bible has to say. People are searching for truth. They just, they may not know that, but, but people mm-hmm. are searching. Um, yep. What, what do you, man, your story is fascinating to me, particularly right now. What do you say uh, about, or what, what's your perspective on uh, some, you know, pretty famous evangelicals or whatever, I don't know what category they fall into uh, right now. And it seems to be kind of like the trend right now to come out and announce on social media that, you never really believed or you've lost your faith or God disappointed you or right. whatever. And so you're walking away. What's your, uh, that's kind of your journey. What, what's your perspective on some of that? I've talked about that uh, personally, um, but it's always been from the outside looking in. Um, when you watch that, what do you think? Uh, one, I think that's a really insightful question. Two, I guess I tipped my hand a little bit when I talked about how I felt when I was going through it. i I was sad. Yeah. I mean, I mean, look, everything aside, what would have to be wrong with you not to want the promises of Christianity to be true? Wow. Like, like, even, even at the, the basement depths of despair and disbelief, I mean, I mean, it'd still be a lot better if there were a, an order to all of this, a reason yeah. for all of it, a God behind it who made it and who actually gives a rip about me. And that there's something that happens beyond this life. And when I die, I don't just turn to dust. And as soon as the last person who knew me forgets me, it's like I didn't exist. Yeah. Of course, I want that to be true. The problem is that I, I'm not going to base my, my life on a, a lie to myself. And so, and so for me, it was very much honest, intellectual wrestling with the data. Um, but I think I had to... <laughs> I think for me that that wrestling was a shift away from be on team good guy, go the right way, behave the right way, sure. buy the right Christian substitutes for far superior secular products, right. you know, all of that kind of stuff. That was faith when I was a kid when I was growing up. Right. And so once that quit making sense and the honest question of is this thing is this thing real? Is it credible enough for me to throw my life at it and invite other people to do the same? Yeah, that's a weighty question. I can't speak to the process that everybody else who's wrestling this through publicly has gone through. Sure, but I see what you see. 
for some of it. I feel like there's embarrassment about some of the political affiliation with Protestant Christianity in America. I think some of that embarrassment is probably well-founded. We get some things right. We make messes at other times. Sure. And so I think some of it is a sympathy toward people who are outside looking in and they see kind of the weird stuff about us. And then, you know, that public figure just gets sick of answering for the stupid stuff about us. And instead of reasoning it through with people and saying, well, here's why we don't think that either. Right. Um, I think it, I think it starts to erode at you and the amount of comments. And I know, some of the people who've come out and made these announcements sure. lately. So my perspective is a little inside on this, I guess, but I know what they're hearing. I know what their inboxes are full of. I know what my inbox is full of. Yeah. And I think the, the most erosive thing for somebody sitting in my position is everybody wants you to sign up for their team. Right. Everybody's sure that everybody else is wrong and stupid. Right. And only the most socially dysfunctional representatives of all different kinds of right. Christian faith and non-faith. Those are the people who are going to put fingers to keys and yell at you about how wrong and dumb and right. bad you are. <laughs> right. And no matter how tough you are, that erodes. It's, it's like you're, you're swimming in this sea of pluralism that never physically could have existed 20 or 30 years ago. Right. And I'm not better than any of these people. We're not, our brains aren't built for it. Our soul's not built. I can't process that much data. Yeah. And, and so I guess my response would be, look, I don't like the way necessarily everybody has played their coming out as not a Christian anymore right, stories, right, right. but as somebody who's had his faith fall apart once and come back together, uh, grace to those folks. I, it's, it's a journey. Um, I don't think the story's done with anybody who's in that spot. Right. And if I could offer any advice to my friends who are in that spot, it would be don't paint yourself into a corner for the rest of your life with words you say now, you know, it's, Faith is weird. It's up yeah. and down, and, and that's okay. Did that speak to the question you were asking, or yeah, I just wander off into crazy, though? No, no, no. It's great. I think um, I think a lot of condemnation has come to some of those people, and I think that's wrong. I think as Christians, if we don't understand the journey we've been on as individuals and the grace of God toward us, and you know all of that, then you know we're extremely naive uh, on one side, or just just hateful and completely deceived on the other. There should be no vitriol aimed at those folks. We should have a broken heart for anyone who does that. Um, but I think it's an important question in spite of that, because I think, like you said, faith is a, is a weird thing. And, and we'll all go through those seasons where we're not exactly sure. So yep. when what's being modeled for us is, well, if you're not exactly sure, then you just you bail. Because, you know, I, I don't think that's the right, the right answer either. I think it bears a discussion, right, for people that ask these questions and, and do doubt, because we all doubt. We have those times. Well, and how sure do you have to be to be a Christian? Right. I mean, how sure am I sitting here right now? Um, I'm on a good upswing right now. When I look out the window, I see what's out here. This is beautiful. And I think about what's going on in my heart and my life and what I'm seeing in the scriptures of my family. But yeah, right now, intuitively, beyond the intellectual, it feels like there's a God who's behind all of this and he exists right. eternally in three persons and that Christ is the son who came here is the key component of God's redemptive plan. Right. But there's going to be some other time, usually during the winter, <laughs> we're just at the very intuitive level. Yeah. It just feels lonely. Yeah. It doesn't and, make sense. Right. Yeah. And, and I just, it's, that's okay. It's just, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. If it was okay for David, if you read the Psalms, yeah. Like ease teetering on the edge of disbelief at moments there right okay i mean it's it's hard if god god could prevent all of that yeah. by physically manifesting every single time we struggle with doubt and then he would be our pet monkey and he would do the stuff that we need him to do and that effectively would undermine his capacity as god and would make him something controllable and subject to the whims of people who struggle with the ups and downs of faith yeah. so i'm cool with the arrangement we have with him for the time being it's just I don't know. I, I think he's enormously tolerant and gracious and patience with the fact that my threshold of certainty continues to fluctuate. And understanding our frailty and all that he's God and we're not. And on some level, we just have to be okay with that. I think uh, if we're not, we're in trouble. I remember growing up. So I grew up in a, in a pastor's home, um, very conservative home. And I, I learned all the right things and I had all the right answers. I went to a Christian college, um, studied criminal justice because I didn't want to be in ministry. You know, because ministry people are weird. Well, here we are. <laughs> take that, sucker. Yeah, take that. <laughs> um, 
but I was, uh, I was like 22 years old. I was married with uh, an infant and uh, we went to the funeral of a young person in our church and I was nominal at best in terms of my faith and my you know, relationship with God. I was a Christian, but that was about it. Mm-hmm. But after that funeral, my wife, she said, I got to talk to you. I'm not a Christian. I've never put my faith in Christ. I know that. And, and everything I've said up to this point, I, I know is just not true. And I've known that for a long time. I need to become a Christian. I mean, this was our conversation, right? And my, my response in that moment as a 22 year old guy raised in a Christian home and went to a Christian college was, I'm sure you're fine. It's okay. I look back on that and think, you you know, you said faith is ups and downs and it's weird. And it's, uh, you know, where do we fall on all that? And how committed are we at this point or another? I'm glad it doesn't have anything to do with me. (laughs) Um, That it really is all about God. And it's about trusting him, even when we don't understand or when we're in a frail state or whatever the case. Yeah, that's great. Important conversation. Yeah. And in in keeping with that, I think one of the pressures that, you know, you felt in that moment as a 22 year old that, I felt in my moment as a 29 year old that I feel right now as a dad with kids that, that I think a lot of the people who were not referencing by name, who in the last year have kind of publicly yep. denounced their yep. former faith. I think one of the pressures we all feel in this moment in history is the pressure to have a stance and land. Yeah. Um, you know, it's yeah. like the Spanish difference between Estar and Ser. At star, like this is where I am right now. Sarah is unchanging to be. This is who I am forever. Right, right, right. And so I think a lot of us are using the language of Sarah to describe where we're at in the process when the language of Estar would be okay. And and because we want to get people in those categories and line up the pieces on the combat board to decide which tribe is gonna crush the other tribe, right. we feel like you know, we're almost being dishonest if we don't land in some place and tribe up right and it's why it's this big dramatic moment if we decide to flip tribes then forget tribes right they, tribes don't care about you they don't care about me they don't care about an honest process of integrity or faith but that pressure acts on us and it makes us behave in ways that you know we have to feel like we have to land somewhere at age 39 yeah. well, why can't this just be where i'm at at age 39 why sure. can't this be where i'm at at age 50 and sure. I'm, I'm trying to do it honestly yeah. Uh, got me a little passionate there. I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. dial it back and notch no, right good, now man. and make your show better. No, it's, that's fantastic. And I think, you know, particularly, particularly for us, for, for our perspective, it's, it's about authentic Christianity, right? And I know the word authentic gets thrown around a lot, but, but all I mean by that, and I think what we mean by that is it needs to be real. And there are ups and downs. There are moments of doubt. There are moments of fear. All of those things are human emotions and we can't escape those. Um, but when we pretend or we put up, put up an image that if you are a Christian, then you always have it figured out. You're always doing the right thing. You're going to the right place. Um, I think you should go to the right place and do the right thing. But yeah, but that sure. doesn't make you more or less a Christian or give you more or less a relationship with God. And uh, Man, that's important to understand. Um, when you look at your show and, you know, everything you're investing your life in communicating and producing, um, if you had a big goal for all of that, what would your big goal be? Can I have two? Accomplish through all of that. Um, can I have two? You can have as many as you want to. <laughs> all right. I ask the question. Boil it you down do whatever down. you want with them. That's how this works. <laughs> I know that. I know that a lot of my, do you call them colleagues, the other people who go around the interwebs and talk about the same subject matter. I know right. that what a lot of people are going for is persuasion, and trying to get people to land in a tribe or in a camp, and. In a lot of ways, you can say, oh, that's perfectly biblical. So I can't argue. I'm not prepared to criticize anybody who has that agenda. I have this maybe naive belief, though, that understanding changes the equation for people. So what I'd like to do with my channel is help people who already are inclined toward faith or enthusiastically into their faith to understand the content of their own document and their own religion better so that instead of feeling like I can't be wrong about anything because if I am, then what has all this been about? I want people to hold on to that relationship with God tightly, but to hold on to some of these ideas, maybe just a little more loosely, bring it back into the question box, out of the answer box, and think about why we think this, and what does this text mean, and how do we read the Bible at all, and where the heck did the Bible even come from? 
how do we know we even should be reading it? And how, why is it authoritative? Let's yeah. ask all those questions again. I, I think the answers are great. Yeah. So what I want to do there is cause our team, if we'll abuse that term for the right. moment, to understand our own content and relax a little bit and feel comfortable thinking about it candidly and right. not feeling like we got to land on the internet every time an issue comes up and announce our stance. Just think, play tennis, hit the yeah. ball back and forth, get smarter, get more conversant in it. And, and that's, I'm not descending from on high to do that. I'm learning as I make each of these videos. So, yeah. you know, I'm learning on the fly with everybody else. But then my other goal is I want people from team not so sure about God, the agnostic atheist crowd, who only have lousy interactions with religious people that reaffirm their biases to have a place where they can come and hear about what people actually think and start to understand the shades and the nuance in that. Okay, these folks think this and this is why they think it. These folks think this and this is why they think it. And I really think that whether folks want to admit it or not, everything we're doing right now in society is a dialogue with the claims of Christ. An atheist might be very upset by that claim, and I would understand it. But, I mean, even the term atheist is a, a negative statement, a negating statement toward God. It's all a dialogue with God. It's all a dialogue with these proposed answers to where we came from and why we matter and what the point of all of this is. And in our culture, like it or not, that's a Judeo-Christian dialogue sure. that's been going on for 2,000 years here in the West. So what I think is if people understand that dialogue better, they understand why people think the stuff they think, why people disagree. I, I think that understanding theology and talking theology can do so much more than make us more Christian. I think it can do so much more than make our churches stronger, though I'm really enthusiastic about both of those things. Yeah. I think talking theology, going right at the thing that divides us, can bridge the gap. And maybe what I get to do is be one teeny, 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 tiny little part of something that is pulling in the direction of healing instead of pulling further in the direction of wrecking everything in the name of our beliefs. So that's why I say I have an educational channel, not a ministry. Right. Um, it's, it's an educational YouTube program yeah. that talks about things that usually only get talked about in ministry settings. Yeah. And it's meant to be very inviting and hospitable to people who think that I'm crazy and disagree with everything I believe. So, you, I mean, you would be more of a, a teacher than an apologist per se. And an apologist would say, well, we are teachers. That's what we do. But, but um, your goal is more to explain truth, put context around it than to argue someone else's position or try to argue them off of their position. Yeah. I, I, I really want to do a good job of representing positions I reject very, very well. Yeah. I would like people to get done watching a video where I talk about something I don't think and be like, that's the most fair treatment I've ever yeah. heard of that from yeah. someone who thinks I'm nuts. Yeah, that's right. I, I've said many, many times over the years, I am not afraid of anyone who will take an honest look at scripture and read it and, and let scripture speak to them and let the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. speak to them. I think if you do that, honestly, you will arrive <laughs> in the right place. I, I just you know, believe yeah. God is, is able to do that. So I don't I need to argue land on, you into that. I think that you position. land on roughly the creeds. Right. I don't need to argue you into that position. I just need to help you understand what's being said and, and understand truth. And really, that's the Holy Spirit's job, not mine anyhow. So, um, yeah, and, and be nice. Like, and be, I guess that's the other goal. Right. Like, be nice, yeah, we, be cool you about think it. If we're screaming at each other, we're going to uh, somehow convert, right? <laughs> like, if I yell louder than you, you'll believe what I say. Uh, man, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I, I can't remember the last time I changed my opinion because that happened. To me. <laughs> just, because someone was screaming at you? No. Nah. Yeah. Nice people who think things I don't think get my attention and they're fun to talk to. And it's much easier for me to give an honest hearing to what they think. Right. Yeah. People screaming at you is like telling your wife to calm down when she's upset at you. Cause that works every <laughs> time, right? Like, yeah. Just calm just down. Just breathe. <laughs> just calm down. Um, okay. So the Bible, um, man, there's a bunch of stuff here. We could talk all day, but um, talk to me a little bit about making God the center of scripture instead of yourself. Because, uh, I don't think there's any, uh, there'd be any argument that we live in a day where man has become the center of the Bible. Uh, messages preached explain how man is the center of the Bible and everything is about you and everything is about your family and everything is about uh, your life. Um, 
when it's not. It's a story of God. I mean, from the from the beginning to the end. Mm-hmm. Can well, you talk about that distinction a little bit? But then talk about how that distinction really does give us hope. Because it's not the removal of hope. It's not removing us from the Bible. It's just not making us the center uh, center point of the Bible. That's a very well crafted question. Yeah, well well said. Um, when we think about the modern phenomenon of the anthropocentric, anthro, I don't know how you say it, person centric version of the Bible, where, where your hermeneutic, your read on the Bible is all it all flows through. The bottom line is, what do I do and what do I get? The easiest thing to point at is your. I mean, the thing Benny Hinn just announced, the whole health, wealth, prosperity, gospel thing. I mean, that's smoking gun kind of stuff where you take passages that could not possibly have meant prosperity gospel to the original audience and you just mutilate them to make it say something that you know is going to sell really, really well. I'm not saying those people aren't Christians, but I'm saying a lot of what they say isn't Christian. That's outside the boundaries of scripture and the creeds. So it's Christian-ish, but it, it is something else. It's easy to point at that and say, man, yeah, those people are the ones who are getting this all wrong. But the reality is, for most of us, that's a pretty fringe group. I, I think the way we get it wrong is by making it about our behavior, our vote, our stance, our tribe. What do we get? The idea that if we're faithful, maybe God won't give us health and wealth, but he'll give us that wife we've wanted for so long. Right. He'll have our bid be the one that gets accepted. Right. And does God care about that stuff? I get the impression he does. Sure. There is, God is not, the God of the scriptures is not karma. He's not some kind of cosmic exchange where, you know, right. you don't look at naughty pictures for eight straight weeks and then you get something in exchange. And I, and that might sound ludicrous to you and your audience, but I've done the pastor thing for 25 years. You know sure. how many people believe in functionally some kind of karmaic relationship between the blessings in their life yep. and, and tech stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really it. Yeah. And so through our own endeavors to impress God with our magnificent behavior and top-notch theology and fantastic discipline, we can say this is all about God. But the reality is that's about us. Yeah. That's about what we get and what we do. And that backwards view, I think it lights a a fuse on the time bomb of faith crisis that went off in my life after seminary. I was mentioning earlier. And so the the danger of this is that eventually the whole thing collapses because you're at the center of a religion that God must be at the center at uh, of you're at the, you put yourself at the center of a religion that the first time you really jack this thing up, you realize this is unsustainable. There's no life. There's no salvation. There's no hope here. But right. what, what you just described, the God-centric vision of history and the, the God-centric version of, of the Bible, that works. Even if there's no Bible, that works. Because we all know that entropy is working on us. We all know the second law of thermodynamics is real. We all know stuff is broken. Whether you think stuff's broken from a leftist perspective because of how dumb and awful rightists are, or a rightist perspective because of how dumb and awful leftists are, everyone knows it's a mess. Everyone knows we've tried for all of recorded human history to solve it with violence and governments and force and laws. Hmm. It, it's not working. Yeah. And the next election isn't going to be the one that makes it work. There has got to be something going on outside the system yeah. that can bring life into the system. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's where the blessing of reading the scriptures as they're intended with God as the main character comes into play. You can just ease up. Uh, you, you can honestly relax to a degree and say the God who's on the other end of this equation is the redeemer. His kingdom is the kingdom that's actually going to work out. And, and the hope that comes with that is in such stark contrast to the hopelessness that comes with my impeccable behavior and how long I can string together, not saying naughty words or whatever your silly thing is. Sure. Um, man, there's so much there. Why, why should we, and this is, you know, 28 minutes into our conversation. Uh, this is where I actually wanted to end up, but <laughs> okay. um, there's so much to talk about, man. Um, but why should we believe the Bible? I think this is one of the, you know, if the devil uh, has a big plan, he's got a big, you know, map somewhere, he's moving pieces around. Uh, I think one of his big objectives would be to destroy um, 
the reliability or the dependability or our confidence in the Bible, uh, because really that's where we, you know, get what we believe uh, for life and eternity and, you know, really anything that matters. Um, and, and you got tons of, tons of information on your uh, YouTube channel, a bunch of videos you've done on this, but why should someone believe the Bible? Someone that doesn't or someone that's not sure, maybe they're raised in a, a religious home, but not, you know, I don't know what they believe. Um, mm -hmm. They're trying to figure that out. <clears throat> why, why the Bible? Why yeah, the that's Bible? a great question. And why not everything else? Why not everything else? Um, two categories of answer, external and internal. So starting with the external, um, the Bible's an incredibly well-documented book. When Martin Luther and Erasmus before him were um, <laughs> translating or organizing the Greek version of the New Testament, and they're working with five and six partial manuscripts, it was quite the endeavor. Now, thanks to the world becoming smaller, you know, the age of archaeology and exploration and, and the internet, I mean, we got, what, 25 to 30,000 partial or complete Right. manuscripts that is handwritten pre-printing press copies yeah. of, of the new testament are you kidding me right i mean it's just it's just staggering so does that prove that jesus is the son of god and everyone should be a christian well no of course not what it does prove is that the bible was wildly influential in years before right now and what it does prove is that you can do a really good job of reestablishing what the original manuscripts, the autographs, as they're called, mm -hmm. must have looked like. And the way we do that is science. Now, all of studying the Bible obviously isn't science. There's art, there's interpretation. But this part is science. What you do is you take all of those manuscripts and you line them up and you, um, you, you look at when, when who wrote what. I'm trying to do this quick, but you look at when, who wrote what to figure out, all right, well, if we got 999 copies from, you know, early in the game that all say it this way, and the first thing that we see that says it this other way doesn't come around until, say, 1300, yeah. then, okay, we know where the, where the mistake was made. So a lot of people look from the outside at the Bible, and they're like, ah, oh, it's just a giant game of telephone. Yeah, it's right, a haphazard right, right. mess. Who knows what the originals were? Right. The answer is... At this point in history, I think we are the most clear we've ever been wow. on what the original yeah, wow. text of the New Testament must have been. So, so in terms of external corroboration and the processes behind these, many of which are carried out by people who aren't even Christians, by the way, people who would be critical of Christian theology, but still do the work of manuscript analysis. Right, right, right. Um, I, am, I am wildly confident that what we have in our hands right now is a Greek text is a magnificent reflection of what was written down in the first place. So there's your purely scientific standpoint, not, not uh, theology, just purely scientific. We've got yeah. a good argument. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then there is a secondary layer of that manuscript analysis that does involve art. And I think people on both sides of the argument, your Dan Wallace's, your Bart Ehrman's would agree with me that there's an art to it as well. Mm -hmm. This would be, handwriting analysis to try to nail down a specific date on an otherwise ambiguous manuscript. Yeah. This would be um, debating and theorizing as to where divisions happened in manuscript traditions. There's, uh, without getting all the way into it, there are kind of a, a couple of separate prominent manuscript traditions, which overwhelmingly agree, but function a little differently or arranged a little differently. So, so there's also historical theory involved, but in terms of just the raw data, yeah, you've got, you got science. And then on top of that, you have some historical interpretation and a touch of art. Yeah. Um, so all the disciplines come into play. And, and then beyond that, you just got the question of, um, you know, somebody might say, well, we have all those manuscripts. Great. But how do we know we have the right books in the Bible? Right. And well, to be fair to the critic, that to a degree does involve the question of faith, but if we just look at the historical record of what Christians thought, we can get really dang close. Now, the Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox both include what's called, what Protestants call the Apocrypha, what they would call the Deuterocanonical books. They don't include the same list, so those two groups do not agree on what Deuterocanonical books belong there, and the Church Fathers don't agree. Some would say none. Uh, the Jewish scriptures don't include them. 
So there's debate about that, but effectively the theological influence of those Old Testament books that mostly date from between 400 BC and the time of Christ, uh, it, it's not huge theologically. So even if we go to the extreme ends of the debate about what books ought to be in the Bible, yeah. you've still got overwhelming theological agreement and only the slightest disagreement in, by the volume in terms of what's there. Yeah. So are the right books in the Bible? Um, well, I mean, the atheist and the Christian might disagree about that, but we can, we can say with very, very strong certainty what Christians in the past thought about that and come to a conclusion that at least what we're reading is what believers thought was Bible throughout history. Thank you for watching. Look forward to uh, meeting with you again next week, every Friday at 10 a.m. These go live and uh, awesome to have the opportunity to spend this time with you. If you're listening, instead of watching, jump over to YouTube. Go ahead and take some time to subscribe. Hit the notification bell. That lets you know when new content comes online. And we're doing our best to put more and more content out there and uh, helpful content like this to help you live the life, really, that you were created to live, find hope in a world that often seems so hopeless. And uh, I trust that you'll be able to follow along and find those things. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.